I went to that residential school, and I know what it means when somebody said that those children died there because I went to a funeral. History is about that lived experience in time. I am an experiment of your culture. Why I can talk to you today is because I cannot speak my own language because it was beating the shit out of us. I had to make choices in life and I didn't like the choices so I wanted to change them. I asked my grandmother what it was like, what was the worst thing at residential school? I, you know, I never really, I know I didn't want to, to disturb her, her past that much, but she was really old and, and I knew that time had passed enough that she could give me a straight answer. Her answer was dentist day. She said because when they ran out of an aesthetic, all the kids were holding hands lined up. And as soon as they started to run out by the afternoon, they'd put the kids into a chair and tie them to the chair and drill their teeth until they screamed bloody blue murder. And so if you were lucky enough that you passed out waiting, they would just put you in the chair and do the work. <clears throat> That's what it means to go to a residential school. <clears throat> I've had so many generations of, of experience of residential school. It is an odd circumstance. <clears throat> My father in this country was not allowed to go past grade 12. This is colonialism. Native Indians were not allowed to go past grade 12 legally. So he went to the priesthood, got a degree in teaching. Then he went to the Calif Indian Residential School and that's where he met my mother. So indirectly, I came from that. So I was born in Kamloops, 1957, in a squaw room. This is a normal place where you segregate native people and people of color so that the whites would not be offended by people like us in the same room. I don't know, maybe we, were, we would cry too loud or something, but that's the reality. I went to residential school. <clears throat> I asked my dad about residential school. He only said it once. He got scurvy. So they tied his hands to a chair, put his head in a brace, and they took all his teeth out. And for three months, his eyes were shut, and he couldn't speak, and his mouth was wired. He survived scurvy. So it was a very difficult, <clears throat> violent teaching. The residential schools were regimentalized. If you, you got up, if we said everybody stand, everybody would stand. If we ever said turn left, everybody turned left. It was just, that was just how regimental it was. You could only go to the bathroom at a certain time. 
Um, you could only eat at a certain time. You only had a certain amount. It was very much regulated. And so it, I, I went there and I, I didn't really like it. But I got away with a lot because my dad was an instructor. And I used to skip classes so that I could sit in the... He worked as a, an instructor in the wood shop. And so the other students would teach me how to carve Northwest Coast totem poles. And so that's where I started making art. I've always been an artist. I've never deterred from that position. My father was trained as a shaman, as a medicine man, and he became a, a, a political leader in this province. My mother was the Homemakers Association vice president. They were always active in all those things, so I got a lot of teachings from those things. The Homemakers Association was to do things like there's a railroad crossing. An Indian dies on the reserve from their cars going by. So they said they wanted to have the regulations changed so that the natives couldn't get killed anymore on the railroad tracks. So the provincial government would say, well, no, that, that's not our problem. The railroad company would say, no, that's not, that's not our problem. The federal government would say, well, that's a, that's a provincial problem. So it, you, you see how this wheel spins. And under the Indian Act, <clears throat> nothing was going to get done. The problem with this country is the Indian Act. Recently, there was a woman who was a senator, and she said that she wanted to get rid of the Indian Act and settle all land claims with natives in Canada. Everybody got in an uproar about it. Trudeau, in 1969, tried to settle the, that solution, abolish all reservations and assimilate all Indians, the white paper policy. The Indian Act is a nasty piece of white supremacy legislation. As a person, I am a ward of the crown. I'm technically not a citizen of this country. The land that natives are sitting on is not their land. It's a reservation. They cannot sell the land. It doesn't belong to them. They're technically, they're just under house arrest forever. That's basically what you have us as. So what, what really comes down to is that I am your enemy. Are we still at war? Do I present a threat to your colonial ideas or your agenda of this world? It's a usufructuary position because it makes us lesser than a human. A dog in this country is recognized as a dog and is protected as an Animal Protection Act. He has a status as a dog. A bear has a status, can be protected as a bear. Salmon, as much as possible, but that's been, that's another story. The salmon are 600 million down to 40 million. It's kind of like watching 
Kill the buffalo, starve the Indian. Kill the salmon, starve the Indian. Take away all his rights. Sparrow versus Sparrow. Natives had to go to the Supreme Court of Canada in this province every single fucking time. You know, it's, it's why I always said, it says, are natives allowed to have an existential thought under the Indian Act? It's like saying, don't even fucking move. We're going to destroy it. That is the use, the beauty of the usufruct. This is, this is our traditional land. This is my motherland. You use it. You benefit from it. We've never settled any land claims to it. I own it. You're on it. Every one of you fruck me every single day in a usufructuary right, my rights, and usurp my rights as a human being because you don't recognize me. You don't see me as a human being in this country. Why stand on a world stage to say that you are talking of freedoms and equalities when basically it's about fascism and being fascist? Because you don't see me as a human being. Someday I will become a human being. I don't need the Indian Act. I don't need reservations. I want to be emancipated. I want freedom. Equality. I don't need the Indian Act. We were never included in the Bill of Human Rights in this country. The veterans went to World War I. They came back home. They weren't allowed to leave their reservation. They had to ask for a pass. The veterans went to World War II. They weren't allowed to re leave their reservations. They were told to go back there. And you wonder why we had suffered from colonizational stress disorder syndrome. Because you're killing it in front of us. Everything. It's like Polly Sludge Lake. You have a, you have a government Christy Clark at the time, she did nothing to those, to those corporate companies that contaminated that. I'll take some of that water there and I'll pass it around in this room and say, drink it. It's Environment Canada, it's safe. Drink it. Can you? We're supposed to be just a bunch of good little Indians and shut the fuck up. <clears throat> well, I'm not because I don't belong to Native organizations. I don't belong to the AFN. I'm not a national chief. They come and go, those government chiefs. My position as an artist is to be a free human being and to freely state the realities and the conditions of Aboriginal people and see what happens to them. 51% of Native children are under the age of 17 right now. 68% of Native children going under the educational system in this country do not complete grade 12 education. This government, this Canadian government, says this is a successful program. Well, then you better be telling your governments to make a bigger penal system for Native people. Because 
if we're going to be at 90% prison population from a 1% minority, you're going to have to make more. You're going to have to make them bigger. Because that's where you're just marching them to. The Indian problem in the Indian Act, the values, half the native children in this country under the human resources that were apprehended are native, come from a 1% group of population in this country. You oppress us to death. It is time the government chiefs give up the Indian Act. What are the solutions? How do you abandon something that, that you've enforced upon somebody? Make a trilateral agreement to the provinces. Eliminate the Indian Act. I won't miss it. I don't need it. That's, that's simple. If you want land, pay an Indian for it. If you want fish, shut down all the fish farms. I can solve the fisheries problem today, right now. Give up the bar treaties. Renegotiate the bar treaties. The DFO is like a bunch of monkeys counting fish. They can't do it. They don't know how. <laughs> Come on DFO cannot look after the salmon. Prior to the Europeans' arrival, the natives had fish weirs and fish ladders. All the fish were counted, and it was a protection for all. They took what they needed, and they let the fish go back. The problem with the fisheries is that you have this one person going, I think therefore I am greedy. And I, I think it's my right to catch a fish and sell it. And every single one of them, one of these saners and gill netters, and they wanted that history, they wanted to take away native rights, so much so that they gave out so many licenses that they've actually just destroyed this industry. There's no salmon in my freezer. I barely get salmon anymore. So it, there's no need for commercial fishing in this province. They've already done their damage. There's no need for, for fish farms. Shut them all down. Start counting fish. Ask your representatives to look at the bar treaties and renegotiate them. Because that is the answer, because that's what tried and worked for thousands and thousands of years before you even arrived. That's why when you arrived here, there was 600 million salmon. I didn't poach them all. You can't blame my sorry ass for all, the, all that salmon disappearing. Yes, the forestry did a major damage to, this, to the salmon industry. Probably wiped out 50% of it. We sell lumber to the United States. We say that it's not subsidized. Every tree that you cut down in native territories is subsidized. You steal it all. They've never paid for it.
What is the purpose to continue with the Indian Act for another 100 years, another 200 years? With global warming going on, is it, is it fair? Will we just sit on our reservations while you destroy this world? You are might. You are power. You are supremacy. It gives you that. Companies. You give a free ride to every company in this province. Shareholders. As soon as something happens, they... They sell their shares and they go, what? I never, I'm not, I don't have any responsibility to that. I'm not a shareholder anymore. These are systems that you created to make toxic wastelands. We have to protect what we have. 83% of United States groundwater is contaminated and unfit for human consumption. So they're going to be looking over their shoulders into Canada for water. Not all of us want to settle land claims. Why would I sell it to you? To any one of you motherfuckers. To extinguish my rights forever. And my inherent rights to any children thereforth after. Would not have any rights at all. Would be completely extinguished. I have to extinguish my rights. Under comprehensive land claims. To you. To all of you as Canadians. To your Canadian government. Forever. How can I trust you? When everything that is done in this province is the direction of the destruction of everything. You can't even get a moratorium on how many logging trucks there should be in this province. Just cut it down as fast as you can. Kill it all. There's not even old growth forests left. There's very few left. Habitats. I know things are changing. When I was a kid, the birds used to wake me up in the morning when I was seven. Thousands and thousands and thousands of songbirds. Five o'clock in the morning would start to make noise. And they'd tell you they were there. But we didn't recognize that as a civilization. No. Now 68% of the songbirds have vanished on the North America and worldwide. These are things that are to come. If it only took... <clears throat> 500 years to kill over 500 million salmon. What is the next 200 years when there's only 40 million left? I, I can do the math. So why would I extinguish my rights forever to you, citizens? and trust you forever. These are the dilemmas that a native has in his heart <clears throat> that says, no. No, I, I don't want to settle land claims. I'm still waiting for back rent. <clears throat> but 
but I want people to understand that they have to protect this land. I don't want you to be patriotic to your flag. I don't want you to be ass kissing the queen. I want this to be your motherland. This is my motherland and love it as much as I do because it's the only land that I have because I don't have some other country, foreign country to go back to. <coughs> Reservations are being contaminated. We've outgrown reservations. There is a solution to the Indian problem and it starts directly with the Indian Act. To make me a full-fledged human being, a citizen of this country, equal to all of you. <clears throat> and, I'm, you know, so I do have a bad colonial day. And that, that's just a part of me. Is that I have to tell my children that this is what's in the store. It's, it's a strange act. I'm half Okanagan and I'm half Salish. I have land on my mother's side and land on my dad's side. All the women that I've married, they, all the statuses, the children went to those tribes. So none of my children were registered to my band. But now I have one, which I will. But that means that the rest of the half of the land that belongs to me is not registered because I'm only allowed to be registered under one band. You see, I have the right as a Salish person to be Salish. But under the Indian Act, I'm not Okanagan. I, I am... Technically, I could go to the band office and say, you know, I, my mother is from here. To go, well, you're not registered to this band and we can't help you. Well, I'm not asking for help. All I'm saying is I, I just want to hunt. They go, yeah, you can do that. and You can ask for permission. And, but I never did, so I always... I played... Who shot the moose with the game wardens? And there's a lot of problems with the forestry management of this province. A lot of British Columbians hated the idea of native people hunting year round. Just fucking despised the fucking attitude is how can those fucking Indians be able to hunt year round? And we can only hunt so much, only so much a, a, a year. Well, you know what their answer to that was? Let's give every British Columbian as many licenses as we can. And we'll kill everything and anything that fucking moves. And you did. Thank you. Because now there's fuck all in those bushes sometimes. You have your supremacy. You have your DFO. You have your forestry management. You have your RCMP, your forestry rangers sticking their fucking gun out and saying, yeah, got your fucking license. You have youth hunt. You've done all these things just to take away my human rights. You don't like the idea of me having a human right to hunt, to gather food, so you'd rather kill it all. That's, that's just ugly. That's gone all across this country like that. This country has to change. 
it's slowly changing. We didn't like Harper. He was an ugly person. He said that missing and murdered Native women was not on his radar. So he gave an open license to, to this country to say, be my guest. And they were killing a lot of Native women. They're more victimized poor, they were always traveling, hitchhiking, vulnerable, economic circumstances brought them into very vulnerable positions. These are things in Canada that can change. They just take time. They're doing an inquiry right now. We're going to listen to all their stories. But nothing will change until you emancipate them from the Indian Act. I don't care what those government chiefs say. They can take their fucking government check. I'd rather have accountability, municipal sharing resources, and having somebody sitting in those parliament buildings equally. You don't have to segregate yourselves as colonialists. We can represent ourselves and stand with you together and resolve these problems. It's a unilateral decision that has to be made equally. Victoria has to open its doors and let me in to represent my people as First Nations person equally as a human being. The days of the Indian Act and the government chiefs are over. They're coming to an My daughter phoned me last week and I talked to her about this and I said, you want change under the Indian Act of the regulations that you have? Try putting a resolution on the floor at your band office saying that no person under, that has less than a grade three education can run for band office. She started laughing at me. She says, Dad, she goes, I know this story. She says, yeah. I said, I keep telling that story. And people don't like hearing it. I said, it gets really funny when I say no Indian person can run for band office or chief in council without a grade six education. She laughed some more. Then I said, well, put another band resolution on the floor. In the meantime, no Indian under the Government Indian Act, government chief can run for band office without a grade 12 education. It wasn't funny anymore. The problem with the Indian Act is that it creates a dumbass Indian because it's an uneducated system which is under control of provincial governments, which indirectly uneducates Native at 86%, 68% or more, which is a success. When we become control over our own lives, when will natives have control over their own education? We've had residential school. I went there, I know what it was like. It was fucking hell. I went to public school. I went from one segregation, I went to another segregation. I was with a whole bunch of Indians. And then I went to a public school and it was all of a sudden, I was the segregation. I was the minority. But I learned from those things. And I got a good education. I liked Rembrandt. I liked Vermeer. 
I seen Picasso's. I went around the world after I looked at books. I was looking at books at a public library because they changed the law in the 60s that I was allowed to live off reservation. And so my dad moved off reservation. He was one of the first families to move off reservation. And so I went to a public library and I seen the arts. But I think it was always a gift. I've, I've always been involved in arts. And I think that's what's interesting uh, is that my job is just to be a shit disturber on this world. <laughs> and as a person, environmentally, uh, yes, we have problems, but can we fix them? There's world problems. I did a painting, Red Man Watching White Man Trying to Fix Big Hole in the Sky. <laughs> and it, uh, at the time, I was still not included in the Bill of Human Rights. Technically, they're trying to say that I'm in the Bill of Human Rights. But I take a position of a usufruct is that I take it away from you. It's hers. I have it. It belongs to her. I'm using it. She owns it. I'm benefiting from it, from resting on it. But it's hers. So under a usufruct, position, it's when do I give it back? When do I recognize this person? Once I do that, then you eliminate a position and you take a person as equal. That's why I want the elimination of the Indian Act. I don't want my rights to be taken anymore. I don't want you to take Native rights away from them anymore. Yes, maybe some of them may not want to like to swear on the Bible or say allegiance to your queen, but maybe some of us do want to go in the direction of a republic. Hint, but uh, that's part of this country that we have to go through. Either you want us in this country or you don't. It's that simple. If you don't want us, just let us leave the Confederation of Canada. It's not that hard. You can have the cities and we'll negotiate everything later. <laughs> so it, I always, I said to a lot of people, I said the Quebec separation was, was a problem because they never talked to the, to the First Nations there. If they settled their land claims with the Aboriginal people in Quebec, they could have left. But you don't come into a province and leave confederation when you come into a province with nothing. You don't walk away with the province. That's the problem that the French had was they thought they owned the province. And so that was, that is the solution to the separatist problem. It is a, their dilemma that they have to resolve. I don't have a problem with the French leaving. I mean, it, to me, it's like, well, maybe the French and the English will stop giving each other the reach around and then we can get on with the business <laughs> of dealing properly with this country. Language is a problem. First Nations language is a problem. I know I went back east and I said to them, 
you know, the difference between the East and Canada is that they ram French down their throats and in the West they ram English down my throat. So, all things change. I have a new missus, she's Persian, and I'm, her baby, our baby's being taught her traditional language from her mother. And she's not going to learn English until she goes to public school. So I want her to have a language that I never had. People need to have their cultural language. I like seeing people in different coffee shops and speaking their languages and dialects and hearing these foreign voices that I don't understand a damn thing that they're saying. And I'm happy for it because I never had it. And that, uh, that would hurt sometimes, but I do love it. I do like being here in this country, but being kind of like exiled on your own land. We don't, really feel at home, that's a very strange feeling. So it, um, I have a protective instinct and I don't like seeing things that happen. And I don't like the Kindle Morgan pipeline to go through I don't think it's in the best of interest environmentally. I don't think that we need dams in this province anymore. They're saying that they're going to lose $2 billion if the dam is not built. Well, that's not my problem. <laughs> I'm just a broke ass Indian. And I can turn my light off on my reservation. We don't use that much electricity. But there is a lot of technology for industry that has been taken away. And a monopoly of another dam in this province is not necessary. I don't think you, we need that much control by BC Hydro. I think that we should allow other small industries that create electricity under different ways of wind and other measures, light by the sun, solar powers, and give them the resources that they need to, to manage and do a better job. And they actually just proved that they would economically would, would benefit more from it. So when you, <clears throat> when you elect somebody, try to elect them under an environmental position. I don't want to see the Harpers coming back, the conservatives. I don't need goose-stepping, redneck Aryan conservatives values. They're racist, they're bigots, and we have to get along. I just want to sit down and have a coffee at Jean's and enjoy it without to worry about saying, they have to be the way of the social credit. Do you remember them? They're gone. Okay? The same thing. Just please, whenever you do, no matter what, don't ever vote conservative. Get rid of them now and we won't have a problem. <laughs> I'm serious. If you're going to go into politics, stay away from those things. It's not a good country. We, we, we need to be more people-oriented towards ourselves. 
to to look after. You are only a 100 mile radius of yourself. If you can't look after that, then you're not teaching somebody else to look after their 100 mile radius. So it, that's why I don't want the Kindle Morgan pipeline. And, and I, I did make a painting, uh, Christy Clark and the Kindle Morgan go-go girls. <laughs> so as a rebuttal with a forked tongue and so I do make political art. I mean that that's the nature of me. I'm I'm just I'm just born an artist. It just so happens the politics of my time. They were dilemmas. I was I was in South Tall Cree, Fort Vermilion, Alberta one morning. And uh, it was seven o'clock in the morning. I'm listening to the radio. Environment Canada comes on and says that uh, we're warning all Canadians in the north that you can't use your rain catchers and you should disassemble them and take them down uh, for the next two months because Chernobyl, as a nuclear radioactive waste, is coming across into your habitat and is, you can't drink the water from your rain catcher. I got up and I went over to the, the that just so happens the band manager lived right next door. So I'm, I'm up at 7.30, walk, trudging across the snow and I, he says, what are you up to? And I says, well, you know, I says, uh, he says, what are you gonna do about this uh, Chernobyl accident? He says, you know, come on inside, have a cup of coffee. And I'm sitting down, he's pouring me a cup of coffee, and he goes, so who in the hell do you think I am? <laughs> and I says, well, you're the band manager. And he says, oh, and, and I'm supposed to, to, to notify Russia <laughs> from the band office to send them a letter to saying that we're having a problem with this radioactive waste. This situation because my next door neighbor Lawrence Iguilton cannot drink his rainwater. That's going to go down really well. So <laughs> he was having his coffee and laughing at me, and I was going, "Well, but seriously." And I had my coffee, and I was still fuming at him because it was his job, as a manager, to see. The absurdity is that as a the band cannot really do anything because they're not even included in the United Nations. Someday, some Indian's going to be able to stand and walk into the United Nations and say, I am a First Nations person. I want you to recognize me as a First Nations person in this world. That has not happened yet to truly be a human being. Those are dreams that I have, probably for my spirit world and my time off. But those are things that, that I dream of. And I think that it's a good thing to have is, is, is to think of human natives as human beings. I've made other paintings. I've liked over the years I think that it's, it's been a great life being an artist. The troubles are, yeah, you would starve sometimes and feast and famine or, yes, living in Richmond, I, like every kid growing up, me and Bill Clinton, I never inhaled. <laughs> <laughs> But that's life. You have to experience life. Um, because you wouldn't know what your limits are to your body. You have to have limitations to look after your body as well. That's a person. 
because I, I wanted to have that steady hand and to paint well. So I, so I, I, I really didn't, you know, I could have drowned in myself in beer and, you know, I, I did go out. Yes, I did party some a bit, but I still got back to doing what I loved the most, which is making art and, yeah, that's, that's important um, to represent, to, to create. To, the greatest thing about being an artist is that I'm the first one to experience it. I spend all that time creating it. Then I push the painting back and I walk back and I sit down. Well, then years ago I used to smoke, I used to have a cigarette and a coffee and look at the damn thing. And then, and then I would send it out to the world and I'd go, see if they'll like that. Or why piss off one when you can piss off hundreds of thousands? <laughs> Which, so it, that was the, I think that's what, uh, I think that was the idea was to start talking about humanities and being a position and the 60s, 70s and 80s and 90s was an anti-native uh, campaign and in the, I woke up to a target. There was a black and white TV and there was a native on it. So we knew that, we know the gig, you know, every day you wake up and there's, you know, I don't like the image of the sailor's design on the police car here in Vancouver. Don't like it one bit. They got it wrong. You know what they should have? The Vancouver Canucks logo. <laughs> Those masters create more hell than, than I ever did. <laughs> more riots than anything. So why should we be the benefactor of, of being racially profiled? Don't need it. I think they, the, the little puck and the <laughs> hockey stick. I've always been tempted to go and do that to one of their cars. <laughs> You know, those are, that's what an artist is. We're, we're there to think about these things. We're there. I, my job is to entertain you and piss you off. To enlighten you, to think of, I'm there to, to listen to all of the world, to its troubles, and try to figure this world out as I'm living it and experiencing it. I am of now. I create for the now. And that, that is what, I don't, I, I, am, I came from a black-faced dancer family. I was, I was initiated into those things. I am a swaikhali mass dancer, but those things are secret societies and stuff. So I came from all those things, but I, I do think that as a modernist, my position as a Canadian, they recognize me that, that I have a direction to go that I want to bring people to come to the conclusions of. And that's, that's what we need to do, is that we can't just say that the Gilnetters and Saners are the people that have the right the first right to all the fish in this province and we're supposed to buy it from them only. And the rest of us are just have to starve. So uh, the fish weirs is a social concept. You have to accept the social, if you can accept health care, just think of the salmon as your health care for you. You have to protect them because they will feed you in the long run. And that's, that's what, uh, that's what, that's why there's people marching and, and talking about salmon and trying to protect the waters. Because 
it creates problems. Not enough salmon, the killer whale starts to starve and the families get smaller and smaller. So can, I can't live without the killer whale. I need my swimming brother. I, I, need, a, I need a bear. Why do, I, why do I like the bear? Because he's there. Because he's my brother. And I like the sound of him, and I like it when I go into the bush that he makes the hair stand on my end, and I know that it's his sovereignty, that is right. This is his land. If you make me settle land claims, I'm going to bring in the biggest grizzly bear that I can find. <laughs> And I'm going to say, here, make him sign it. Because I'm sure in hell going to wait for him first. Because land claims doesn't work. You can't afford it. It's priceless. They're spending millions and millions of dollars under the Department of Affairs, wasting money on research on land claims. There's no point. I know this province is broke. It doesn't have the money. It's sitting at a, playing poker with, with and I'm just gonna call your bluff. So that's why I say share the resources. Turn them into municipal jurisdictional boundaries and share everything. I'm not afraid of it. You know what? Yes, some groups will become very, very wealthy. They should. The Salish here for every land that's sold, pay them. If you want to cut a tree down, pay for it. If the Americans want water, make them pay for it. If you accept the idea of native rights, then they're there to protect everything for everyone. So it, we're not afraid of development, mines. It's if you do it right. But Poly Sludge Lake is not. We can't have those types of policies that infringe upon all of our rights that you can't drink the water for the next 300 years. It's crazy. Why, why would, that's why we can't settle land claims. We just don't want to. It's, it's, it's in our best of our interest for, for all of you, for us not to. There is an anti-campaign amongst Native people to not settle land claims. There is a growing number of Native people that say no to the whole thing. No. So what is the solution to the Indian problem? Which is get rid of the Indian Act, make me a citizen, and open the doors. It's the same thing for band offices. Why have a dumbass Indian chief sitting there in office which has a grade seven education when you can get the most educated person in the universe to come and work at your band office to solve your problems? I'd rather do that. I don't care what color of skin you are. I just want the job done right. That is the problem of the Indian Act is that it, it's too controlling of a system. There's a long ways to go. It, it's 1969 was the white paper policy, abolish all reservations, assimilate all Indians. I'm already assimilated. These clothes that I wear, 
I am assimilated. Let me assimilate myself to direct the direction of what people want to be as native people. Allow them to do these things. Allow them to educate themselves. Have those systems put in place. So it, I would rather have a national woman's nurse, a national teacher association. It's too top heavy, the AFN. It's an old boys club, doesn't work anymore. Never did. It was another government, AFN government chief concept. They don't do anything. Treaty government chiefs won't work. What we need is a new direction, and that is abolishing the Indian Act completely. And it will save a lot of headaches. And it, yes, it will make Indians rich, and it'll make Indians poor, but that's just the world. What's wrong with having a, an um, emancipated Indian? There's nothing wrong with it. It's the idea of thinking that I would free him from, from his reservation in Canada it scares you. <laughs> that I would be a free human being, that I would actually be a human being. To be considered one to, as an equal. Where somebody like me would say, no, I don't want you to cut down that old growth forest. No, I don't want you to put that, that ski resort there. Maybe we can do something else somewhere else. No, I think the grizzly bears need to be there. You know, it, that's, that's just the nature of, of natives, of their instinct is to protect. The idea of sovereignty is everything has rights. If I walk down the street, do I step on the ant? Or do I see him and I step over him because I recognize him and I see his spirit. Do I swat the mosquito? Or do I try to let him out the window? They're two in the same, but they still deserve the right to be here. One bugs me even more, but that's just the mosquito. And but I believe that all things have a right. I came from that tradition of philosophy of equalities to everything. Everything is sacred, has a connection to each other and its reason to be there. I try to live that and I, I, it works. I got a bird feeder in front of my place and I, I feed my birds and the sparrows and the little songbirds come around because I displaced them by moving into an apartment building and the building took up so much space and there's no more green space for them so, so now I have to compensate for them so that they can have food to live with amongst me. So I ask you to do the same, is that when you go home and if you can get a bird feeder in your communities, put them up because they do need our help. It's a simple thing, life. We start to care. And that, that just, that's how things start to get things going. I kind of covered most of what I wanted to say. I, I thought about this for the last couple of weeks, what I was gonna say to you all. Scratching my head, worrying about this day and time moment because as you can see I don't have a written lecture I just 
I'm a free person that talks this way. And if you have any questions, I can answer any of them that you wish. So, please. Thanks so much, Lawrence, uh, for sharing your time in it. The, also, the work that you did with the Rename BC campaign in the, in the <coughs> face of people like Stockwell Day uh, from the right wing, ideologues saying that these things are untouchable, that we can't rename Stanley Park, we can't rename the streets from the corrupt mining bosses and all the uh, English elites that name our streets. Your uh, pointed focus and saying, yeah, actually, these things are not untouchable. It's really uh, refreshing and helpful. And I just want to flag for uh, settlers and migrants in the audience that we've started a new website, re redressvancouver.ca. And uh, I think it's time, way over time, that we, we visitors, foreigners, we don't, we don't rely on Salish people like Lawrence for the leadership, but that we, as settlers, start solving this colonial problem that we've created for Lawrence. So um, when people are leaving, there's Redress Vancouver cards. So you can check that out. Thanks very much. We can also share that on our, on our Facebook and the I did have fun with that renaming receipt. <laughs> sure pissed off a lot of them, but that was fun to start. Yeah. So seeing as there's, there's nobody uh, up, uh, chomping at the bit to, to ask a question or maybe a comment. Oh, sorry, um, I have a question. If we're moving ahead, do you have a question? Sure. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. And then, um, Lawrence, would you say it's fair that you still have trouble articulating or even understanding what could possibly have been so abhorrent about your culture to make someone else want to totally annihilate it? <clears throat> annihilate the native? Yeah. Well, smallpox did that job. So I think in terms of reading uh, guns and steel, Colonialism as its agenda was always true to its nature. There hasn't been a single culture that has been able to withstand capitalistic Protestantism. The idea of, of colonialism as it stands, <clears throat> the world is not going to change in its onslaught. Um, global warming, I mean, if we're really going to go that direction of, of humanities, how much time do we really have on this planet? Uh, yeah, I mean, let's just keep them on the reservation and let them enjoy watching the obliteration of the planet. But that is the solution to power. Power is, is something that people are are very hard to to change. Can can we say that give me the electric car in, in twenty years, stop all motor vehicles that are gas driven in twenty years to save the planet? You can't, it's too late. I agree. In Scotland we have a popular notion which is we're very conflicted about climate change, because on the one hand, it will afford us the opportunity to sit on the mountain and watch the English drown. <laughs> I think we're still stuck with the concept of, I think, therefore, I am greedy. Well, this is a play on words of Descartes' famous axiom. Yeah. He's French. And it, <clears throat> we haven't been able to get over that yet. So it when do we stop to take the consideration of everything other than the individual? So, uh, sorry, if, if, I, if I could just now intervene, um, okay. I should introduce myself. Um, I'm Samir Gandesha, and um, I'm the director of the Institute for the Humanities. Um, we're sponsoring this, this talk this evening. Um, and I'd like to take the um, prerogative of the, the chair to ask a question yes. of my own. So, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so, thank you very much, uh, Lawrence, for, for a, a profoundly moving um, talk. It, it, was, it, it was incredibly powerful. 
um, witty uh, and deeply insightful and enlightening. Um, and I couldn't help but see reflected in your words uh, your own uh, artworks, so at least the ones that I've seen. And it seems to me that there is a kind of constellation here uh, of at least um, two d different um, sides of your work. I mean, there's a there's the searing, um, I think in some ways brutally searing and necessarily searing uh, works um, uh, like Residential School Dirty Laundry. Um, and of course, I think this talk could have been entitled uh, Shooting the Indian Act Two, right? right? So there are these very direct, politically engaged um, works. But then there's also, and I think this mirrors the, the kind of hopeful and, and dreaming dimension of your talk, right? Um, there's also the, the um, uh, uh, Ovoid series, you know, profound expressions of shape and, and voluptuous color. Um, and I think this creates a beautiful tension that on the one hand we need uh, 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 criticism, negativity, uh, in my words, negativity, right? Um, but then we also need that dimension of, uh, of hope. And, and I think in those works, and, and this has always been part of the, the modernist tradition of, of autonomous works, that the artwork represents a kind of semblance of freedom, right, of human freedom. So if, if, I, I'd love it if you could talk a little bit more, and you, you, you're suggesting things all through your talk, but I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about the role of art in education. Education is an important theme, and also yeah. the recognition of the humanity of the Indian, as you put it. So if you could, that would be wonderful. Oh, did I take yours? That's this one's so don't steal my water. Yeah, I know. <laughs> 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 it's never going to that bad habit, you know. But <laughs> I, uh, I find uh, I touched on it earlier. Was does a native have the right to have an existential thought under the Indian Act? And it's an ludicrous statement because the Indian Act was so empowering and to Canada, the benefit of Canadians, that I had to emancipate myself from the concept and try to create conceptual Abstracts. The natives were just pissed off. The traditionalists were hardcore. And, um, but I, I was, you know, even Bo Dick, as an artist that I grew up with, uh, understood what I was doing as a modernist. Somebody has to deal with this shit. How do, I did a painting that, um, that was dealing with a, an abortion, Alcoholics on the Res. And it, it had to deal with those things. There was an Indian inside a bottle. And... Um, I wanted, I, I knew that I had to deal with this stuff. And so he was wrestling himself. Is he drinking to pickle himself? Or is he just hop in and just go for it? Because he suffers from colonization stress disorder. I'm gonna drown myself in alcohol. Just marinate myself in it. And so I made that painting and, and uh, so it, it was, they, they were, I did a drawing that did uh, abortion because I had a, a native woman that had one. And so I thought I would draw the spirit of what it could be or what it might have been or what it isn't and what it would never become. But it wasn't my place. It was her right and only her right to make that decision. And so I respect that position, and I accept that. And this is my body, and that is hers. 
And so that's where the difference is this is my right. That is her right. That's a choice that she gets to make, not me whatsoever. So these are art concepts that I was dealing with. And I think that that's what I, I'm Glenn Woods, who's from the Northwest Coast, Northern tribes, he was going, no, you can't do that, I go too late. <laughs> and he's the traditionalism is his but I says, it's already done. And he was going, you're breaking every rule. He says, it's, is it, is it Franz Boa? that you're worried about? <laughs> is it uh, the anthropology museum that, that you have to answer to? Uh, is it Tourism Canada that you're worried about? That, And so it, I had to make a decision and I did. In 84, I was at a Symposium, Hazelton, and Robert Davidson and Norman Tate were doing a lecture like this with all natives and telling them that if you apprenticed under me for 10 years, you'll have a good name. And I'm sitting there going, for fuck's sakes, I have to kiss your ass for 10 years? <coughs> It was not going to happen. They did not understand the depths of a reservation and a residential school and the chaos that was in front of me. And traditionalism would just didn't allow the concept to be put on a totem pole. And it, Hills was not the place to sell it. I was more interested in what other artists in the world were doing. I liked The Raft of Medusa. It was a sick painting. <laughs> <clears throat> and it, the political upheaval from that painting was, was incredible. The political, I watched, I looked at a painting of people holding their hands up in the air and, and a firing squad shooting them. And I seen these political paintings. I was looking at your world, looking at mine simultaneously, trying to decipher what was happening in my world so that you could see from your world what was happening to mine. So they were unilaterally exchanging cultural identities within the framework of modernism. And I chose modernism over primitivism as a concept. And I modern, took a modern approach to the position that it was necessary to create abstracts, to create uh, different bodies of work that I was working on that were interesting, that was very, very hard hitting. I mean, a killer whale jumping out of a oil spill. This killer whale has a vision, comes, talks to me. So it these habitats of these animals that have things to say to us have a right to be here. <clears throat> and so all the dying whales in the ocean, every time one of my brothers, my swimming brother dies, I hear, see him, and, and we have to listen. Or I at least give the understanding that that's my swimming brother and we need them. So that's why I made these paintings like that. So that's just my nature of being. So I, I think that I utilize modernism 
because I am from two different worlds simultaneously. I am a spirit dancer, black face dancer. I am a Swahili mass dancer. And I am Salish, and I am going to kai around the fire and be a wild savage. It's just my nature. Can't help myself. I like having a drum, and I just like to, to be around that and feel the nature of, of, of drums and song and spirit culture. It, that's all that stuff is hidden from, from this public because it was against the law. And, uh, but it's there. Um, there's non-natives that have become spirit dancers. There's a priest, I think, uh, I've seen over on the island. The problem that he had was that nobody was going to church anymore. And so he said, well, became a dancer. He asked the Vatican, the Vatican said, sure. So he came into the longhouse and He'll say his prayers and whatnot, and he'll sing his song and that, and so it, it accepts the position. So my understanding is that I have to talk to the outside world, and that painting is a Western concept, and the the arena to be in. If you've ever walked into the railway station in Paris. If you don't have your shit together as an artist, you better. Because there is some beautiful work by many artists of this world that have given the gift that, that, that you just, it, it's, it's, it's something that, that another artist understands when he's seeing something like that. Um, I'm, I'm going into London this month, and I'm going to fly over to uh, Florence, Italy, to go see the Statue of David. I believe that's a very beautiful piece of work. And I think that the man that did it deserves me as an artist gazing upon in, in real time, other than in a book. So... I'm lucky that I get to be in this time in history that I can be in, see the Northwest Coast art and see the world of art. And uh, that's, that's what it really means is, is in a world, you're only as good as your last painting. So sometimes on a good day, I can hit a good painting. Sometimes I do feel that I do make work for the world and and in time, they'll come to understand <clears throat> its own space and reason. Thank you so much for that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm behind you taking notes as you speak. <laughs> I've had <clears throat> um, artist organizations that hire and ask that the students come by and visit and I critique them and give them shit and, or, and help them to develop. So that's my, my approach. I'm, I'm not a good, I would never make a good instructor. I, <laughs> I, would, I would be the worst because I think that uh, I'm a creator and, and that's, I'm always in the creative mind. There's so... It does, uh, you're like, we're like every human being. I mean, we have our moments, so, but yeah, I do. People do come visit me and have things to talk about. And I always say, you know, if you're gonna be an artist, have your sketchbook. If you're gonna live an artist, you know, be responsible to your body, know your limits and uh, That's a very hard time. This time in history, when we were kids, I could say, you know, that, you know, that I'd never inhaled much, but I think that at this day and age, with fentanyl and other drugs coming into the body, that it'll stay in your body forever. 
certain drugs in the body doesn't work and you can you can burn out and die and kill yourself and get supremely fucked over but it's the discipline of caring for oneself and caring for the world that that the, for the love of everything and its insanity and your own sanity or insanities or whatever is just is to look after that and never give never never lose it so it's you can they can help you but then they can hinder you so i so i i think that uh my i i find that i don't need those things uh as much anymore um i know that bo came to my studio and he said uh, to one of his my other friends colleagues that was there he said more drugs and he looked at my work and he says he doesn't need any. <laughs> so, it, so I agreed with him. And but you know that that's the world is that the creative process is a natural thing to develop, but it takes discipline, drive, and more drive, and never some you can have all the drive in the world and you never make it, but but some do. So that's that's I think that. I asked that question, what would I be if I wasn't a, an artist? Um, I said, well, maybe I could have been a politician. <laughs> but then would I be your dictator? <laughs> <laughs> to save you from yourselves, from the planet. But yeah, there, there is, a, that's what I, 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 I do see people come to my studio and they're, they're young people and they, they need, guidance uh, but skill that's just practice you can never have enough so if somebody says you have a writer's block that's bullshit you can never have writer's block because you're always writing if you're always drawing or creating there's no such thing because you're not practicing it's a it's an escape to say that. Sure. You talk about your choice as an indigenous artist to take, to, to practice modern art to show the world, uh, show the colonial world uh, the indigenous experience and sort of reappropriating or appropriating <laughs> as an architecture student at UBC, I like to think that I'm undertaking a similar journey in my own way to imagine as an immigrant or a descendant of immigrants to the country, to imagine cities, but to show, uh, to show the colonial world what those are like through an indigenous perspective. Um, I guess I, I was, so one of my question is, I, uh, I'm wondering what your thoughts or advice might be. How, what does an indigenous city look like? What does an indigenous civilization look like? Given the existing conditions, I have an existential crisis. <laughs> because I, I, I'm serious. Because I've been doing this for a, a long time, and it's something that I'm really passionate about. And, uh, Every street would be able to have a bike. Yeah. Street. A, I have a lot of ideas about so it. it, you have to have everything. You have to design a city that would encompass a lot more environmental friendly things that that we need. Why I bring my cup to the coffee shop. You see, I was the problem. I went into my studio and there was fruit flies everywhere, and I was going, what the hell are these little guys doing? They're just having a national holiday here. <laughs> <clears throat> and so I started looking at all my cops, and I'm going, okay, this has got, I've got to change. I can, I can change. I'm a man, I can change. <laughs> I should. I can't be this way. And so I did. So I eliminated all my cups, and I take a cup, to the coffee shop 
and they make it. And I sit there and have my coffee. Then I said, now the fruit flies are mad at me. <laughs> but they still will live on. So it, the th simple things of how, how we, <clears throat> can we make environmentally friendly garbage dumps? Do we need garbage dumps? Can we recycle, why do we have garbage dumps? We have the biggest garbage dumps. Canada's, that's what that's, I am a Canadian garbage dump. I am Canadian. I, that's, that is the one of, that is the biggest problem that we have, is that we need to recycle everything. Why is it in certain countries that they can recycle 80% percent to 90 percent of everything and sort it out and create it so it that would be kind of one of my solutions to a city without garbage that would recycle everything um, but all windows would have light that would reflect heat to give heat would make energy solar all buildings would have refractive <coughs> sources so that none of the songbirds would hit their buildings so that thousands and thousands and thousands of songbirds would stop dying i would like that kind of thing. It's just a thought. Um, that kind of uh, no el all electric or cars. A city completely with with only electric cars, or even a tunnel where you just shoot somebody across town. <laughs> Yeah, just put them into some air bucket and <laughs> throw them across town in so many seconds and he would jump out and here I am. So using technology to advance, um, robotics uh, that takes time. But yeah, we can, there is things that we can do that, but we don't. I would make human waste on the land and not in the ocean. I would stop all human waste being put in the ocean. Um, the medications and everything from that process would be processed. So if you, can you, can you make water into steam, into air, pure? Or do all the medications go into the air with the steam into the air? See, these are things that we have to be aware of. It's like I, I won't go to a sweat lodge if somebody's been on coke because I don't need his sweat. So you have to make habitats clean, filter cities, that. How do you make gardens accessible to instead of 300 miles to right here. So do, how do we do those things? It's, it's a nice, it's a dream, but we're not there yet. We're not, can we make 
habitat? Do we have habitat as an infrastructure to ourselves? That, that, uh, <clears throat> I like my strawberries from the United States in the winter. <laughs> Watch Cloudy with the Trans and the Evolve, <laughs> all those inventions and everything. Uh, but one question, if you could expand a little bit on um, your idea of um, uh, reserve being run by a non-native uh, person, in my view, if those uneducated chiefs were to be trained, were to be educated in the finances, in the, the way it used to be, ecologically, uh, financially, working together with all the other tribes. It was all done. And then the colonialization came in, conforming us breaking us down and then reforming us into this organization with the um, Native uh, Department of Indian Affairs. Yes. Um, I traveled my way out on um, decolonizing. I was brought up in the 60s school, disconnected from my culture as well as my grandchildren, my granddaughter here, uh, they were disconnected. And I said, not again. So I went to court and I got them out of there and back with their family. Um, but my view is that the First Nations who already know our culture, um, most of them somewhat, and the new generation coming up, they desire this change, this, this coalition and growing up economically and sensibly. If they were educated, which they are, UBC, SFU, um, in the uh, government and the politics and the environmental, they're educated and bringing that to the reserves. Um, I wonder if you could expand a little more. Eliminate the reservation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Indian Act is an act. All it is. Yeah. <clears throat> if I say that this is all Salish land, okay, I want everyone to look after it. I'm going to hire the best person in my Salish territory to look after it. It's no longer, I no longer need my status card. I'm going to work with a municipality. I'm going to work with a, a government. And I'm going to be a free human being. I would say that eliminating reservations is to say, this is our traditional territory. Yes, we will have problems in, in certain areas. The, there's overlapping of, of traditional territories, the usage, but that's no different than any problem of forestry zones, provincial parks, federal park, municipal parks, crown land. So those things have all taken their position. But to say this is Indian land, to say that you're in my territory, and so we all have to look after it. So I would say that <laughs> electing that position from their communities is to eliminate this, is, this province is 96% non-treaty. So it, in, in other provinces, they're, they're, they've settled their land, but this province is a non-treaty province. 
So it, it's a different ball game here. Uh, and I think that opportunity is, is, is to give a different direction to, to sharing resources to say that, well, why don't we just give every native person ever born in British Columbia a million dollars? From now on. No, just to give it to them. <laughs> just for being born. So the province makes billions. Has made billions and billions of dollars from this land. Could sure in hell afford a million dollars for every Indian. <clears throat> so it that is what in terms of eliminating the government chief. I don't have, I can't trust in 17 years, 51% of native population is gonna come of age, which is gonna be from, they're gonna turn 18. They're actually, they're, all, they're already two years old now. So they are moving and they are 51% of the majority. So you can't settle land claims in this province because they are the majority. And you can't accept a three-year-old to settle land claims with you to understand what you're saying. My first-year-old daughter is just learning how to say hi and say mom and dad. So. I don't think she's going to understand land claims. And so I figure that it's a non-starter. So we have to go into another direction, which is to share the resources and work within the infrastructure of what is necessary to protect habitat, to protect uh, everything, trees, birds, and to, to share the resources. Yes, people need to have to cut down a tree from out to time. But yes, they can make a lot more cement apartment buildings. Um, so less, less trees being cut down and more cement. We're becoming solid cement human beings. If we can move away from cutting down trees, um, the globe has to come back to a balance of carbon, so the faster we stop cutting trees down, the better chances we will have. Right now, we can't stop the carbon levels because the governments are not willing to change that right now. So it, I know that it means that the idea, you can still have a chief, but it, it just means that it's not a reservation. It just means that the municipality and the mayor and the chief will sit at a table simultaneously and unilaterally talk. I don't think that that's a problem. Um, so how do you share power or how do you share the land? Do we, do we share it like, let's put the natives on one tenth of one tenth of this province of land on reservations and we take the rest. I don't think that I want to see native peoples sit on colonial reservations for the next 200 years. I think that if it does go that way, then, I, then my alternative is to say, just roadblock it all. Just protest and shut down all the highways, everything as much as you can and disrupt as much of this colonial concept as you can until we get changed that we share everything. It's, it's a difficult thing to say, but that's, but that's the teaching that, we've, that I come from as the Sailors people is, is, is a position of sharing, not traditional chiefs the old system doesn't work anymore. What we need is somebody that actually
can look at the demographic stats and read documents and understand what 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 is happening to our biosphere, what the temperatures of of the seasons are, what fluctuates within the waterways for for small fish fry. What you know, so how do we protect all of those things? So yeah, I'm 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 about disbanding the Indian Act, which means sort of getting rid of an old system which is not working. I want something new, and I, I'm thinking in a different way that means that, no, it's not my, that I'm putting my chief out of a job, I'm actually having somebody come forward to, that is qualified. I yeah. agree, um, abolish the Indian Act. So that those ones that are secluded to these contaminated reserves can be free to go on another part of a rich, unceded land. If somebody's Salish, or say if I'm in an Okanagan territory, since I'm half Okanagan, I go, well, I want a piece of land over there. Well, yeah, okay, go ahead, build it. And, well, you're only half Okanagan, so we're only going to give you half an acre? No, you can't do that. You have to accept the idea that a person from his ancestral territory is allowed to build. We've outgrown reservations. Children under the Indian Act, um, don't have land because there's no land available because all the other family claimed it. So it becomes a land grab even on reservations. So <clears throat> we've outgrown them. They're too contained. The population is, is expanded. We're the fastest population growth in this country. We have four to five kids. I have seven, all girls. But that's me, that's because uh, I'm, I, I do populate native world. It's, I mean, it's the nature of me as a native person. <coughs> and we're going to continue to do that. So I feel that I need more space. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that's a great uh, um, note on which to, to end. Right. Um, please join me in thanking I'd also like to thank all of you for coming and uh, for your terrific comments and questions.